So I played Daggerheart, and spoilers, I was actually really impressed. Last week I posted a video with a general overview of how the game works, its core mechanics, and some of my thoughts and first impressions of it based on reading the rules. However, like I mentioned, I actually hadn't played it yet. Well, I was lucky enough to get to playtest a session of Daggerheart with Nathan from D&D Unoptimized, Alex from Exploring the Build, and a couple of other friends. Definitely go and subscribe to D&D Unoptimized and Exploring the Build if you have not already. They have some amazing videos and you won't be disappointed. Let's help them grow, so I've left a link in the description so you can go check them out. Alright, so I'm going to be breaking down my play experience into three sections. Character creation, the flow of play, and combat. Each will be timestamped, so for everyone that always gets mad at me for forgetting to timestamp my videos, enjoy. Also, I'm going to do my best to actually not spoil any of the playtest campaign that was provided, so this video shouldn't be ruining anything for anyone. I'm currently on a quest to hit 10,000 subscribers by the time that the revised 2024 D&D books release in September. So if you like what I do and want to help me reach that goal, a sub to the channel would really, really mean a lot. Shout out to all my members, Julian in the Champion tier, Jackal3 and Jumpy Sonic Bear in the Hero tier, and Julio, Siren XY, and Brain Laborks in the Warrior tier. I really couldn't do this without you guys, so click the join button to help support me for as little as $1 per month to get early access to new videos, priority replies, and so many more things. Thanks. Character creation is honestly uninteresting. Sort of. Let me explain. Creating a character in 5e almost feels like an experience of its own in a lot of ways. It's why Colby always starts his videos with if you enjoy creating characters almost as much as you enjoy playing them. You enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or... And yeah, there's obviously a really big difference between building a theoretical character up to like level 20 and creating a first level character for a one shot, but even just making that first level character in D&D just feels a bit more engaging. Now, to be fair, this is certainly one of those things that can go either way. If you don't enjoy the tedium of determining your ability scores, assigning proficiencies, expertises, selecting languages, sifting through equipment, deciding your subclass before you even get there and preparing for it, then you'll probably really enjoy the way that character creation is actually handled in Daggerheart. I kind of enjoy the spectacle of slowly filling in my character sheet in Dungeons & Dragons. It's fun, it feels immersive to me, but maybe that's because I'm not really designing with optimizing in mind, but rather just what kind of makes sense for the character that I want to play, so it never really feels like a math problem to me. <laughs> and in that capacity, I personally find building a character in 5e to be more fun, even if it takes a bit longer. Creating a character in Daggerheart feels really easy, which is certainly not a bad thing. In fact, it largely speaks to an element of the design that they were shooting for, and I think they did really well with that. It probably took me maybe 15 or 20 minutes to actually completely create my character, and bear in mind that this was the first time that I had ever seen or read most of these things. I can easily see a world where once you've made a few characters, you can definitely have them ready to go in 5 minutes. This is great as far as approachability is concerned. It manages to largely accomplish something that I have talked about in previous videos, about how I would love to see a world where D&D can just be picked up by a group of people who have no experience with it and play it one evening without really doing any preparation. This is one step closer to that, and I am absolutely here for it. Probably my least favorite part of the character creation process, though, was assigning my character traits, what D&D refers to as ability scores. The rules provide exactly one method for doing that, and it's essentially a standard array. You get to assign a plus 2, plus 1, plus 1, 0, 0, and negative 1 to each of your character traits in any arrangement that you want. Now, at my table, we love rolling for stats, because I guess we just like the chaos, but at least for right now, Daggerheart doesn't provide any other method of stat distribution. And obviously, you can do whatever you want and come up with something at your own table, but that logic applies to literally anything about the game, or even D&D for that matter, so it's not really a helpful point. We are looking at what is provided in the text. Trait distribution in the way that they've done it in Daggerheart has the benefit of consistency, which is nice, but it also just feels a little bit bland to me. I'd love to see them introduce other methods of doing this that maybe create a little bit more excitement. If you always use the standard array though, this probably won't bother you at all. On the flip side though, probably my favorite element of character building was the thing that I was most dubious about while reading the rules, and that is the experience system. This actually proved to be so much fun in my opinion, and I was actually able to even use them during the game, which made it that much more satisfying. Experiences essentially let a player homebrew some small part of their class, and what's cool is that this can be different every single time you make a character, which I think is really fun. 
An experience is an element of your backstory. It's something that you've done in the past, something you've experienced or are experienced in doing, which mechanically translates into you getting a bonus on certain roles. If a role comes up that you think your experience would allow you to benefit from, you can spend a hope to add that modifier to the role. You get to start with two experiences, one that grants a plus two and another that grants a plus one. You can also gain more experiences as you level up. As for picking cards, it was fine. There aren't really all that many to choose from at first level, which makes sense and lends itself to a quicker character build as well. There's not really much different about this than choosing a spell or something else in D&D. Alright, so that's the main points for character creation. Let's get to the actual flow of play. It's probably worth mentioning that everyone in the game is a fairly experienced D&D player. One of the players was actually someone from my own weekly game. So what this led to was a game that largely felt really smooth in practice. You could definitely sense some hesitancy, particularly at the beginning as we were getting used to the more free-flowing style of the game. We were asking more questions like you would in D&D instead of just kind of doing things and playing in the moment, but that's something I feel like we all got better at as time went on. Nathan, our GM, did a really great job asking us to describe and narrate our decisions and actions, which definitely made us feel more engaged and invested in what was happening in the moment. Obviously, this isn't something that's unique to Daggerheart. They aren't reinventing the wheel here. This is something that a lot of Dungeon Masters do at their tables to help foster that sense of creativity and accountability in the game, but something about the structure of Daggerheart made it feel a bit more meaningful. There was something about knowing it's how the game was intended to be run, rather than just something someone wants to do that made it feel more natural and organic, and less like we were quote-unquote wasting time by describing things. It's kind of hard to explain. With that said though, let's talk about the dice and rolling. As you probably know, when you make a roll in Daggerheart, you roll your duality dice, which are 2d12s of different colors. One representing hope and the other representing fear. Depending on the die that rolls higher, your hope or fear die, the implication of that roll can change. Though you can still succeed regardless of which die rolls higher. What that means is that every roll always has five potential outcomes. Success or failure with hope, success or failure with fear, and a critical success. This puts a lot of pressure on the GM in a way that isn't necessarily common in games like 5e, depending at least on how you play. Now, we didn't actually roll with fear all that often, we got pretty lucky, but the perception I got as a player, and what Nathan confirmed after the game, is that having your party succeed with fear is really challenging to pull off. Both giving your group what they want and throwing a wrinkle in at the same time is very difficult to do on the spot. Emphasis on on the spot. It can be easy to sit down and think of tons of different ways of ruling each role, but when you have to come up with something that narratively makes sense, it suits the role and isn't too devastating but is meaningful, and do all of that in just a few seconds really is a tall ask. I do think that even fairly experienced GMs like Nathan and myself and even Will from D&D Shorts will struggle with this element of the game. At the same time though, because of the unpredictability of never knowing which die is going to roll higher, if your party just constantly rolls with fear, there's only so many wrinkles you can throw at them before it either just gets exhausting, tedious, or oppressive, or any of the three. This is something I anticipated being potentially problematic from just reading the rulebook and was more or less confirmed by my experience in game. One thing that all of us noted was just how in control we were able to feel. We really got the impression that the story was ours to do with what we want and steer things in a way that really suited our goals. In that sense, it really felt like a game for Dungeon Masters. Sometimes transitioning from DM to player can be challenging, but this felt a lot more natural since the heavy narrative element of the game was really evenly distributed around the table, and that was really cool to see. Because of the nature of how Daggerheart plays, it really feels like it embodies that spirit of critical role much more than 5e does, despite that being the system that they are actually using. In order to achieve a critical role-like game, you have to, and Matt often does, completely ignore the book for a lot of things to make them feel more epic and let the players take the lead a bit more than they otherwise would be able to. And to be clear, there is nothing wrong with that at all. They've been incredibly successful doing it. But the structure of Daggerheart allows for that type of game to happen without even feeling like you're quote unquote breaking any rules, because it's just how the game works and that's really fun to experience. As a result of the way that the skill system works in 5e, with so many role variations, with players who have assigned proficiencies to tons of different ones and continue to improve them over time, in a sense you almost feel compelled to call for roles. In an effort to not invalidate some of the choices that players have made throughout their character's progression, you want to offer roles. It's encouraged, and at the same time, 
the whole system exists and takes up a large proportion of your character sheet, so you may as well use it. But in Daggerheart, you don't really feel that compulsion. The GM doesn't feel obliged to offer superfluous roles for the sake of them, and the player isn't just looking at their character sheet wondering when their choices are going to begin to pay off, because their character choices are kind of always paying off. Every decision and every action is a chance for your character to grow and try something different and powerful and creative, and it's really cool. One final thing to mention in this section is the accumulation of hope. I'll touch on it again during combat, but it is much easier to amass large amounts of hope than it is to spend it, and this happens for two main reasons. Firstly, you actually have nearly a 60% chance at rolling with hope. This happens because critical successes also generate hope. We were pretty lucky in our game and did actually crit fairly often, I think 4 or 5 times over the course of the session. I actually made the first roll of the night and it ended up being a critical success, and this is the second reason it's slightly easier to accumulate hope. Your chance at critically succeeding is also slightly higher than it is in 5e, sitting at around 8%, 8.3 technically, compared to the typical 5% from a d20 roll. Believe it or not, this really does add up over time. Now, obviously, you can just get unlucky and roll with fear a lot, but the dice are stacked in the player's favor. But there's just not all that many ways to actively be spending your hope. At least not at level 1, but that can certainly change over time, and maybe we just weren't paying enough attention. Alright, on to combat. This was probably the biggest question mark on mine and everyone else's mind, and if you've never played a system without initiative, you might be wondering, how does it work? And the answer is, surprisingly well. But before I get to that, I want to talk about my absolute favorite mechanic in the game, stress. While not technically exclusive to combat, this is probably where you'll use it the most. Stress is something of a resource in Daggerheart. It's what gets marked when you take damage below your minor threshold, but when it's more than zero. More importantly though, it can be used to power up moves or even be used by the GM to denote some additional consequence or strain on your character for trying to do something that they might not ordinarily be able to do. My warrior had an ability called Retaliation, which allowed me to mark a stress when an enemy damages me to automatically deal damage back to them. No attack roll necessary. This was so cool, and I used it multiple times. I also had the ability, though I didn't use it, called I See It Coming, which would allow me to mark a stress and expend a hope to roll a d12 and add it to my evasion score when a ranged attack is made against me. The Seraph has the ability to mark a stress to stand in the way of an incoming attack on an ally and reduce its damage. There's so many cool and interesting ways that stress can be used in the game, including, like I mentioned, the GM being able to narratively have a character take a stress to accomplish something. Alright, so no initiative combat. Starting combat and just having the GM say, what do you want to do, is a surprisingly liberating experience. You don't need to worry about the housekeeping of rolling initiative and setting up your tracker and seeing how everything falls into place. Instead, you just kind of do things, and it works way better than you'd think. The biggest challenge is probably what you'd expect it to be, and that's worrying about stepping on other people's toes. Worrying about taking too many turns, or going first, or just kind of hogging the spotlight. I think this is an issue that is largely solved by experience, not only with the game, but also with each other. I only knew one other player at the table when I played, and I think this definitely created some hesitancy for all of us, as we really didn't want to be domineering and take over the fight. Not that that's really any of our natures anyway, but we didn't want it to be perceived that way. What was interesting, and something that all of us noted, is how as the battle went on, it almost became intuitive just whose turn it would be. Maybe the enemies would make a brutal strike against one of us and pass play back, and it just kind of made sense that you would want to retaliate. Or an ally would perform some really crazy maneuver and you'd want to immediately follow it up to try and finish off the creature. It made combat feel almost cinematic at times, and so freeing to not be constrained by the initiative order. There was one moment during the final fight where Julio, who was playing a rogue named Wrath, charged forward toward me with a dash as I was surrounded by a few enemies, and used his Reign of Blades ability, which actually ended up critting and taking out multiple enemies at the same time, and feeling inspired and relieved by that, I was then able to immediately follow it up with a swing of my blade into another creature. It was such an epic moment that was really only made possible by the fact that there was no defined initiative order. The ebbs and flows of battle are much more tangible in this system. Since every action you take generates a possible move for the GM, you can have these swings of the party going hard on the enemy, but when play does pass over to the GM, either because they spend too fear to make it their turn, or because a player just rolls the fear, they can take an equivalent number of actions. 
At no point though did I ever feel like it was unfair that the GM was getting the chance to interject or take multiple actions in a turn. It felt right and perfectly fair. Something that is worth mentioning is that the combat system in general does also feel skewed towards the players, and it definitely feels much more predictable than in 5e. Oftentimes in 5th edition, you can design an encounter and not really know how it's going to play out. I don't really feel like that's the case in Daggerheart, unless you're clearly intentionally swarming your party with tons of enemies with the intent to kill them. There's also a couple of reasons that I think this is the case. Firstly, the dice. Again. Because of the 2d12 system, not only do you have a slightly increased chance to crit, like I mentioned earlier, but you also have less of a chance of rolling with fear, which means that the GM can often feel forced to spend fear to take a turn, which leaves them with less to spend on their various abilities. This can kind of snowball depending on how your party rolls. As a side note though, it is kind of emblematic of the system. The more you roll with hope, the greater your morale, your ambition, your confidence, it gives you something to hold over and ride forth on. So, narratively, I can kinda see the logic behind it. The second reason combat feels more predictable is that not only does the party have an increased chance to crit compared to 5e, but the enemies can't crit at all. There's currently no mechanic for the GM critting, so the party gets to escape the brunt of those abilities. I will say, I kinda wish they could critically hit, and this would probably be one of my first homebrew rules that I incorporate. Another reason to go back to the dice is because you're rolling 2d12, your average roll is much higher and you gain greater consistency as a result of rolling two dice compared to the GM, who is at the mercy of the notoriously swingy d20 for their rolls. This asymmetry of dice can have a pretty significant impact on the reliability of enemy rolls compared to player rolls. One final reason is that because there's no initiative, all of the party members get to work together and plan turns out really well and orchestrate a sequence of events that isn't really possible when using initiative based systems, at least not to the same extent. On the topic of rolling or not rolling, something I've seen come up in discussions is the idea that it can often be optimal to not roll or to not take actions in certain situations because it risks giving the GM additional fear or action tokens. And I mean, now you're kind of in the region of just game theory here since as established, you actually do have a better chance at rolling with hope than not, so it's probably still worth trying, but irrespective of that, to me it just feels like it ignores the main purpose of this game which is supposed to be narratively focused. You should be doing things that make sense and the things that you want to do. If it genuinely makes no sense for your character to do something because of whatever is happening, then sure, don't bother. But I just don't really believe in not making an attack or taking some action because you're worried about giving the GM some additional resource. That's really going to be up to the individual player to decide for themselves though. On armor, kind of like I expected from my overview video, it is pretty clunky. Taking damage, checking your thresholds, subtracting your armor score, comparing it to the new threshold, deciding if you want to use any additional features to help reduce it further, it's just a bit tedious and doesn't really flow with the rest of combat in my opinion at least. Conceptually, I think it is a really cool idea but it just feels slow and awkward in practice. On that note, the damage thresholds do also sometimes lead to a little bit of a feels bad moment. Say you attack and deal 7 damage, that hits the enemy's minor threshold, but you don't necessarily know what their major damage threshold is. And say you've got an ability that lets you add 1d6 to your damage, and you're deciding if it's worth it to use it. So you decide to, and you roll a 2. Now, since that doesn't hit the target's major threshold, you ended up expending a resource and you accomplished absolutely nothing for it. This actually happened in our game to me, which is why I know that it's just not a great feeling. In 5e, even if you roll badly on your damage roll, at least you get something for it. Now, some people might really enjoy this, and technically it can be solved by your GM just revealing all damage thresholds, but then the game becomes more about math and less about the story, and again, that just doesn't really feel like it fits with the vibe. Overall, I really am quite pleasantly surprised with how much I enjoyed playing Daggerheart. I thought I would like it, but I kept my expectations pretty tempered, as there were a lot of things in the rules that I was pretty skeptical about, and to be totally honest, I had a ton of fun. All five of us did, in fact, and I expect that we will play it again. The game is not perfect. There's some awkwardness and smoothing out that needs to be done, but by and large, considering this is just playtest one, I think it's sitting in a really good spot. Let me know what you think if you've played Daggerheart or not in the comments below. Subscribe to help me reach that 10,000 milestone by September, but otherwise, take care.